All right, Nicole, I'd be derelict of duty <laughs> if I didn't ask you the $26 billion question. Is that right? What could that be, Pete? What was it like <laughs> when you learned that LinkedIn was sold to Microsoft for $26 billion? And not only that, at a 50% premium of where the stock closed the day before? Yeah. Well, I will say that we at LinkedIn are very excited about our pending acquisition with our parent, future parent company. Um, as I'll talk more about, our mission and vision are, are aligned for the two companies. And so our mission at LinkedIn is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And every? That, every one of them. And That's we are horrible. super excited about it. And it directly aligns with Microsoft's vision around ensuring that the workplace is more efficient and effective for every individual that uses Microsoft. And so we're excited about the work that we're going to be doing together when the deal closes closer to the end of the year. Very good. Well, Nicole, like so many of the best and brightest in this town, you left the Hill and left the Obama administration to head off to the tech world. Beyond the cash that we just talked about, why'd you do it? Well, I will say that at my core, I'm a human rights lawyer. That defines everything that I've always done. And so when I spent 10 years in government, both five at the White House and five on Capitol Hill, it was really because of my goal to expand opportunities for those from inner city environments like my own, like the Bronx. Um, and being a product of the Bronx, for me, I've always been interested in the ways in which you can expand opportunity for anyone from various backgrounds. And as this president would say, tech is an equalizer. This industry can function in a way that really ensures that anyone from any background can have access to more. And that's what we do at LinkedIn, and that's why I transitioned from the White House and, and joined the company. So I have to ask, did LinkedIn find you through LinkedIn? <laughs> no. Well, after I left the White House, I actually created a nonprofit designed to increase resources for inner city youth through technology. And like many of the entrepreneurs in this room, I spent eight months pitching my nonprofit to every tech company that I could find, um, and probably to some of the individuals in this room, just hoping that they would fund it. And my now boss at LinkedIn called me up and said, we can't fund you, but we're doing something pretty exciting, and we want you to be a part of it. And, and that's our economic graph. Well, tell us a little bit about the economic graph. I've heard a lot about it, but uh, give us a, a deep dive. Absolutely. And so for the individuals in this room, you are a part of this economic graph. We have over 450 million individuals around the world on LinkedIn. And what does that mean? 7 million companies, 30,000 institutions of higher education, over 7 million jobs right now that we can see on LinkedIn in over 200 countries around the world. And when you put all of that information together, it means that I can tell Patricia, my friend from Xerox, who I met earlier, from Gary, Indiana, we can talk about the number of companies that are actually operating in Gary. Or Heidi, who's from Walla Lala. Wa Wa Don't look for <laughs> help from me. <laughs> she's from uh, Walla. Wa see, Walla Walla in Washington. Thank you, Heidi. Um, you know, we can talk about the number of individuals who are in Walla Walla in Washington, not only on LinkedIn, but when you compare that to other labor stats like the Bureau of Labor Statistics and ONET, it apply, we, we actually complement additional labor stats. And so you're filling in the skills gap. You're able to really understand the demand side of the workforce and not just the supply side. So Nicole, do you all have more data, you believe, than the government itself? Uh, I will not say that, especially as a former government staffer, but we will say that right now data is incomplete, especially at the federal and state levels. And so recognizing that the public and private sector can work together to expand access to broad information and broader insights 
Um, so our data is not more than the government's, but I, I think it adds an additional layer that they don't currently have. And what, are, what do they not have? They don't necessarily have real-time information. They don't have information around why companies advertise for one skill set, but as Gaurav told us, will hire for another. They don't have information around that skills gap and how do you align the educational programs in Walla Walla or in Gary, Indiana, with the demand that employers are, are absolutely articulating. So y'all are the glue that are really connecting the dots there. We try to be, and, and we're excited about all the work that we've done in this space, and happy to talk more about that. We've had partnerships with both the White House, Europe, with the New York Tech Talent Pipeline, with Civic Action in Toronto. We've worked with governments around the world, including Manchester, Amsterdam, Milan, Stockholm. And you know the work that we're doing in the US is actually the work that I'm most excited about because it directly aligns with the reason why I went to government in the first place. Can you give us some real world examples of the type of work that you're doing with a locality or a region? Absolutely. The work that, that we've done with the White House, I think, is a prime example. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the White House initiative on tech hire designed to increase the public and private partnerships that are happening in over 50 cities around the country as we speak. So whether it's Gary, Indiana, or Detroit, or Louisville, or San Francisco, we've worked with each of these cities to identify who are the employers on the ground so that policymakers don't have to rely on employer surveys. Um, we've, we've given them information not only on who the employers are, but what are they hiring for. We've given them information on who the educational programs are and who's teaching for what tech-related skill sets that are in demand. The work that we did in Toronto is also of interest because you know, Toronto has 40% youth unemployment as we speak. And for them, it was a question of how do you use LinkedIn data to understand ways in which they could resolve this youth unemployment crisis. Uh, and so we used our data to identify the employers who would typically hire millennials in jobs and keep them, as Pete has done a good job of keeping millennials in jobs. Uh, we wanted to help them figure that out, and, and those are the partnerships we're most excited about. Okay, Nicole, we hear a lot about the skills gap out there. So what, what are the biggest trends that you're seeing out there to really bridge the gap? So we're seeing a couple of things, and I don't want to get too far ahead of what we'll launch later on this year for those of you who are paying close attention to LinkedIn and the economic graph. Oh, we're, we're friends here. You can share, right? We are friends. It'll come. Give, give us about a month or two, and, and we'll definitely circle back with each of you in the room on, on the skills gap. But imagine if, beyond just talking about this skills gap, if we could identify measurements around the skills gap, if we could talk about cities that may have a broader or lower skills gap than others. So we're, we're excited about understanding ways in which our data can help cities and policymakers address the skills gap. The trends that we've seen more broadly around millennials and job hopping, I think, have been of interest uh, because, like Gaurav mentioned, we're seeing that millennials are hopping jobs more often than their Generation Y and X counterparts. And they're doing this for a number of reasons. I think one, because they're not feeling the impact. They're not seeing the ways in which the work that they're doing is having value across the board. So connect it to the bigger picture for them. Connecting to the bigger picture. And I think that's something we can all do as employers in the room as we strive to create environments that are more sustainable and, and, and frankly, that will retain talent in a way that is commensurate with the, the impact we want to have around the world. So you have a captive audience here. Uh, if you're going to give one bit of advice to the employers in the room that are out there looking for talent, what would that be? Well, Pete, I think you're better positioned for that advice. I heard that you had a company that was one of the top 25 companies to work for. Well, we, we, had, we had some fun <laughs> in our time, so. <laughs> well, I think a couple of things, just from a, a LinkedIn perspective. You know, we encourage employers to understand the ways in which, regardless of where they are, regardless of the industry within which they're operating, 
uh, they can absolutely recruit talent from across the board and go beyond just the pedigree. They can use platforms like LinkedIn to understand the skill sets that anyone can bring to the table beyond just the traditional forms of recruitment. So whether it's the Wilson rule or the Rooney rule and going beyond just what you're traditionally looking towards as you want to bring in people from various backgrounds, I think that's something we can all aspire towards at, at every level. Now, I know that everyone in this room is perfectly 110% satisfied in their jobs, but if anyone isn't, what advice would you give to those that are looking? Well, there is a platform that has 7 million companies that are on this platform right now with over 8 million jobs that you could leverage to identify that dream job. And even if you don't necessarily have the skill sets for that dream job, this platform also bought the largest online course provider called lynda.com last year. And you can utilize this you know, online tool to not only access that dream job, but to get the skills needed for that job. I would suggest using those type of tools like LinkedIn <laughs> to, to find that, that dream job. All right, like, this is like getting uh, Peyton Manning to help you with your throw. So <laughs> if you had to offer a little bit of advice on how people could improve their profiles, what would it be? Absolutely. Well, my colleague Dan Horowitz, who leads our advocacy and outreach team, is also here. And Dan and I are available to talk to everyone in the room offline about the ways in which they can expand their profiles. I think what you can do in the meantime is ensure that you're publishing, ensure that you're liking and sharing content on LinkedIn. It absolutely increases the visibility that you have across your connections, across your network. Um, I'd also recommend following people. I follow our CEO. I follow our future parent company CEO, Satya. Uh, we're, we're excited about all of the ways in which LinkedIn, as a publishing platform, can provide value for those those who may not have information around management, leadership, other, other values in their day-to-day -day, um, workplace. Wildly innovative, amazingly interesting. Nicole, thank you very much. Of course. Thank you.